Hello, and welcome to this presentation of a nonlinear contact example in ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. We've taken an example and duplicated it and set a contact pair to have slightly different behavior so that we can compare the two results. Let's have a look at the basic model. Here we are in ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. Let's have a look at the model. What you see is two rods. They cross right here. If we look at them in a top view, you can see that one is above the other. We have created a contact pair. These two rods are too far apart for a contact pair to be automatically created, but we've created a contact pair with contact on the smaller upper rod and target on the larger lower rod. If we look at some of the details of this contact pair, you'll see that we have the face above for the contact, the face below for the target. It's been set to the non-default frictional contact. The friction coefficient happens to have been left at zero. It could be given a non-zero value. As it is, it's going to behave the same way as a frictionless contact. We've manually set the behavior to be asymmetric, so there's no second contact pair in here in which the lower body is treated as contact and the upper as target. This model is simple enough that we didn't need a symmetric contact pair. In this example, other things have been set to program controlled, but we've gone in and manually set a pinball radius. While the default would be program controlled, we've set a radius and we've set it at 5 millimeters. If I go to a front view and zoom a bit, you can see how big the pinball is. When we deform one of these two bodies, we do not want it to move by more than the pinball radius in any one substep. And we need to control the number of substeps in consequence. The reason for that is that we do not want the upper body to penetrate the lower one by a distance greater than the pinball so that the contact is not even detected. We will be taking care of that in analysis settings. In case we get into convergence difficulties, we chose that the time step should be halved if there's some convergence trouble. Even leaving this at no time step control would probably work in a model this simple, but we put in automatic bisection just for a bit of safety. The mesh was kept tolerably fine. You can see that we concentrated elements at one end, so we'd have a number of elements where these faces were going to touch. Something to notice, this is nowhere near the mesh density that would be required to pick up Hertzian contact stresses where these touch each other. Our goal here was merely to detect contact and get reasonable model behavior, but this will tell us nothing about the kind of bearing stress where these bodies actually touch. Let's go down into the environment. We've put, you can see the yellow color, an imposed displacement on the end of this rod and we moved it down enough that it will touch the lower one and give it a push. We've also put two fixed supports on the ends of these rods, the far ends, here and here, so that they're acting like two cantilever beams and we push down the upper rod and it starts to push the lower one. It's that simple a model. In analysis settings, you can see that we asked for 20 substeps to start with and a minimum of 20 steps. That's in order to capture the interaction of these two rods in some detail, capturing the point when they touch and being able to play an animation based on real results. We permitted a maximum of 100 substeps in case of convergence trouble. The model is not particularly big. Statistics here for the mesh tell us we had 28,000 something nodes, so there's under 90,000 degrees of freedom. And for simplicity then, in analysis settings, we requested a direct solver. The model is stable, the bodies cannot fly off, so we turned off weak springs. And since we're moving the upper body by an appreciable distance, we decided to turn on large deflection analysis 
the model is already nonlinear because of the nonlinear contact. And if large deflection effects are slight, it should make little or no difference to how long it takes to get an answer. Other controls in here were left at defaults. We did, however, request nodal forces so that we can examine some of the forces when we post-process. There's the first fixed support, there's the second one, and we put a displacement on the end of the upper rod. We moved it down, you can see in the y direction, minus 7 millimeters, which if we zoom in and compare that distance to our scale here, you can see that 7 millimeters, which is about this much, is bigger than the gap, and they are going to touch. Then we moved on, and we solved the model. You can see that just past the six-second point, which happens to be about when these two rods touch each other, more iterations to convergence are needed. Let's have a look at some results. Here's the deformation. Let's zoom out. And let's rotate a little bit. And let's see what happens if we animate this. The upper one comes down until it touches the lower one. You'll see that it touches the lower one partway through ramping up the load. If we look at the displacement of the bottom body only, you can see that up around the six second point, the contact takes place, at which point the lower body starts to move. Let's animate that. So it does nothing at first, and then it displaces. If we have a contact tool for the contact pair, it will show us results on the contact side, not the target. There's our status, and we can see that we have, are considered to have touched and are sliding here and here's a pressure pattern. Now don't expect that pressure pattern to tell you anything about the Hertzian contact stresses. The elements are nowhere big enough to give you any detailed information about the local stress. There's the force reaction where we put force on the upper rod and you can see here that when one rod touches the other the reaction force is greater as we continue to displace the end. The fixed support here has no reaction until the upper rod touches the lower one, and then you can see that that reaction force builds up. So what we have here is a model that ran quite easily and showed what happens when we move one rod down until it touches another. Let's go look at that alternative model that I mentioned. The difference in this model is in one of the contact settings. If we click here, we'll see that time step controls were set to predict for impact. And what will happen is that as the contact elements approach the target elements, the software will sense it and it will cut back the size of the substeps right down to the minimum that we've permitted. In other words, breaking the displacement into a hundred parts as we get close in the hope of not over-penetrating in any one substep and getting better convergence. It hasn't mattered in this particular model, but it does do a more accurate job of detecting when these two items touch. If we look at a record of the deformation, you can notice a clustering of solution points right here, which is when one rod approached and then touched the other. If I animate this, You'll see the same kind of plot as before. It just goes into more detail when they're about to touch. Here I've animated over solution points, not a group of points equally displaced in time. And so the apparent movement of this slows as it goes through more substeps as it just about touches. Let me run that one more time. There it takes those detailed steps as it just comes into contact. Right there. If I look at the plot for the lower body only, this too doesn't displace until it's touched, and you can see finer detail 
picking up the moment of contact because we cut back on the size of those substeps predicting for impact. Our pressure plot for the end of the run will be similar to what you saw before. And the force reaction will take on the same kind of final value. And there's that reaction. We end up with the same displacements because there's not much path dependence in this model, particularly with the lack of any real coefficient of friction. So what I've tried to familiar with in this presentation is the fact that you can set up nonlinear kinds of contact. You may want to exercise settings to improve the detection of initial contact and to get convergence. And you can review deformation, reaction forces, and contact status to get a better understanding of what happens during the run of a model. Thank you for joining me.